And so just again, welcome Niels. Thanks a million for being here. Uh, really excited for today and for next Thursday, just in case someone doesn't know next Thursday, we have a second part. The reason why we decided to do it in two parts is so that we didn't have to cram an awful lot of information in just one day or alternatively make it too long uh, and make it really hard for people to see it. So uh, we hope that by making it in two sets, is actually going to be easier for anybody to gather the information than they need. Um, just again, just for you to know, two sessions, that's really important. And today we're going to be focusing on designing a mixed lowland farm. Next Tuesday, we're going to be focusing on uh, diverse horticulture and upland crofting. So I'm just going to do a really short uh, presentation of Niels, just for you to know that he's a researcher, he's an advisor, he's an educator designer and tree nursery man, so you can see that he's done a fair few things in his life. Uh, and he's been working with agroforestry and sort of like regenerative uh, design for more than 15 years now. And he advises on soil health, on plant grazing, agroforestry, whole farm planning, infrastructure, on farm trials. So he's your man. I'm going to be sharing his Instagram, Facebook, and um, Twitter pages in the follow-up email in case you want to learn more about what he does or keep up with what he's doing. I highly recommend it. It's great. And so with no further ado, Neil, the screen's all yours from now on, and I'll just turn myself off so that I'm not interrupting. Niels, can you hear us? Yeah, we're already good to go now. Um, okay, so yeah, welcome everybody. Um, hope you've had a bit of rain up there, um, and otherwise not too much. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to basically take you through a bit of a, um, a whistle stop tour um, of different um, agroforestry designs, um, agroforestry layouts, different um, examples, and see if we can kind of like um, pull together some examples that or ideas that are suitable for uh, your kind of situation um, but uh, we're going to do a little bit of focus on this place here um, this is Wakeland Agroforestry which is one of the, the most um, established sites uh, in the UK but otherwise kind of generally sort of looking at things like general benefits uh, soils, functions that you can utilise um, trees for, uh, different types of trees or selecting trees, how to pattern uh, your plantings uh, for those different benefits, some information on species selection, uh, a little bit on the issues, um, and probably a bit more on establishment next week, uh, a little bit on snow, um, and then just sort of framing the whole um work through different kind of farm types if you like because you know there are different sort of like cases um that different examples fit better or worse for basically um so what are those kind of main benefits that we're looking for uh we're looking to like provide shelter for stock and crops um we're looking to um, provide potentially some shade, um, particularly at these times of year, basically. Um, increase production, diversify our operations and, you know, build soil, basically. Those are our kind of like sort of general headings, if you like. Um, and within that kind of, we sort of boil down um, these different farm types that we'll look at a couple of now. Um, so we're looking at sort of upland grazing, organic rotations, conventional arable, horticulture, and this diversified sort of retail and house hospitality. Um, I guess the sort of crofting should fit in there as well. Um, but yeah, I think that like one of the part of the work, part of the analysis is to sort of identify sort of what situation you're in, what kind of context you are working towards, what scale you're working at, for example, um, and then matching the solutions um, with that, basically. Um, so the initial thing we're going to do is sort of dive right in, basically, and do a little bit of 
kind of virtual tour um, and just take you around um, some images that I recorded um, of this site in Suffolk. So maybe we just zoom out a little bit so we can see where we are in the world. So this is just off the um, just in the east coast of uh, Suffolk. So just gonna. So this is an interesting site. It's on about sort of 80 acres or so, divided into three um, main blocks, um, with the sort of eastern side being mostly uh, double row planted hazel uh, on a 12 meter spacing. So that makes 14 meters between the trees, including the sort of one meter um, tree row or sort of grass strip beneath um, the trees. The situation there, they are rotating arable um, and uh, sort of a lay planting between these alleys. Just try and zoom in a little bit more. So these systems are mature, that, which um, created in, in the late 90s. And all tree rows are orientated north to south. Um, Doug is asking, why are the tree rows on a north-south orientation? Is there a particular reason for that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the north-south gives you the sort of maximum solar gain. So if I just kind of zoom out of here, try and orientate ourselves exactly north. Oops, exactly north-south. Um, so it means that the sun is at the highest point in the sky when it's due south. So you get the, the most amount of heat and light into um, the, the alleys, as it's called. So the spaces in between the trees um, are typically called alleys. And let's just move ourselves around. Move ourselves around. Um, so that these um, pattern is laid out so that um, there's a, there's a hedge effect uh, every time um, these species are coppiced. So they're coppiced on a two, uh, in this case, a five year rotation um, and with the, the alternate rows, which you can't really see in this example. But um, so so each alternate row is is cut uh, sort of every five years. So that maintains the sort of hedge or wind breaking effect. And again, sort of those winds are moving uh, north, sorry, uh, generally sort of east to west. So we're trying to um, um, provide protection from prevailing winds. And um, by orientating north to south, we also gain that advantage as well. Um, so obviously the winds coming in from the left and the winds are coming in from the right, generally speaking. Uh, and one of the things I've noticed that on this site or recorded is um, a reduction in potato blight, or at least um, a kind of partitioning in the spread of potato blight. Um, and so it just sort of like colonizes sort of one alley at a time, as opposed to just sort of sweeping through the whole crop. Um, so um, that's all sort of beneficial. Um, so if we move over from that side, we're moving into a kind of a mixed um, sort of timber block. Um, oh yeah, one of the things I was going to say about the sort of the double row is yes, it definitely maintains the, um, what's it called? The wind breaking effect and the hedge effect even when you are coppicing or have coppiced 
but the issue that they have found is that um, when doing the coppicing work, and it's normally done with a with a machine in this case, just a sort of uh, quite an old fashioned circular saw mounted on the back of the tractor, um, and that um, unit basically drives along the row, sort of north to south, basically cutting down a whole row, um, and then coming then they come back and collect that material uh, later on on basically sort of uh, in a separate session later in the winter and what they found is that actually although it does maintain that sort of wind breaking effect um, what they end up with is all the material let's say here on this inside row gets hung up uh, in the branches um, of the standing um, crop basically so that actually hampers um, the um, the speed at which they're able to harvest the material, basically. Um, so if we're moving over, then this, this sort of taller row in the middle, this is a windbreak. I think this is a mixture of poplars. Um, also mostly poplar, I think in this case, poplar and alder. Um, so that's a, kind of a taller growing um, crop. I think this one has also been sort of coppiced fairly recently. It was a lot taller, um, but that's, you know, sort of an infrequent thing, sort of maybe there's been coppiced once um in its life then as we move over into sort of the central block the kind of timber block you can see how wide the sort of grass strip is or the tree row um probably about three meters in this case maybe even a bit wider um and that's sort of part of the sort of pattern for us of row planted system is you have the trees themselves and you have the grass below them um so let's just sort of for a bit. Um, so as you can see, these are fairly widely spaced um, and actually in places not that well established, just sort of a gappy um, establishment. Um, so that's definitely kind of um, a lesson for those um, looking to establish new plantings is we're looking for a fairly uniform establishment along the row so that when we come to harvest uh, or do pruning work, for example, whether that be timber in this case, which will be a long term um, crop in sort of a number of years time, um, we want to have you know, a fairly uniform stand or that we can thin and harvest um, trees that are a fairly good Good nick, basically. Um, spin around, so we're starting to look south. Um, and I think the system now is a, coming on for 20 years old. So this block at the, the bottom here has got a mixture of things like ash, uh, Italian alder, and uh, cherry, etc. Um, and you can see the sort of height and the amount of shade that is cast. This is a, these are early morning pictures. And in this case, you know, they they are sort of cultivating um, between between the rows, sort of in the in the alleys, if you like. And this section is a an orchard, a kind of productive fruit tree planting. Um, and I think this one is on a wider spacing than the one before. Yeah, so I think it's probably more like a sort of 24 meter spacing or maybe 18 meters, something like that. Maybe it's not quite double the width, but certainly wider. Um, and again, the establishment not so great um, in this case. So, you know, we're looking to control weeds um, and control deer pressure, for example, uh, when we're establishing new plants. Um, so the final block at the bottom um, which is probably the most sort of intensively managed system on the site. Uh, again, double row planted, um, in this case, biomass willow, um, just sort of hybrid willow plantings. And uh, they have been pretty productive. They've got some uh, decent yield data. And actually both the hazel and the willow 
um, produce well. Um, they feed a biomass boiler, wood chip boiler, um, in the farmhouse, and the farmhouse is totally self sufficient for uh, wood chip. And this is the material that's been collected and stacked. Uh, so it's kind of you kind of season it in the field basically, and then sort of uh, you know a season later or a year later, uh, that material is then sort of chipped um, to order basically. Um, so it's quite a neat system, um, and given that they're all in um, straight rows, it can all be fully mechanised, both the harvesting of the trees um, and in the handling of any arisings. Uh, and in this case, the willow is copies on a two year rotation again with them being double rows so alternate two year rota um, two year rotation um, um, and as opposed to the, the the hazel which is on a five year um, but what they found is actually there's an equivalent um, calorific value between Per, if you sort of total it up per year, basically, um, the fact that the, the willow is uh, done every two years, you know, the sort of um, the wet weight uh, is significantly higher um, in terms of yield than the hazel, especially as the hazel is only cut every five years. But then the hazel wood itself um, has significantly higher calorific value. Um, so the BTUs uh, per square um, meter or kind of per hectare basically work out equivalent. Um, so um, there's definitely sort of uh, an indication for both of these. I guess the main thing uh, or sort of main advantage with the willows is obviously they're tolerant of very wet sites, although this is not an example of a wet site. They're on pretty light soil out in the east. Yeah, so they're definitely tolerant of, of varying conditions, um, but they will give you very early harvest and very uh, early um, shelter, basically. So they can give you shelter in the probably the, the, the first year, if not the second year. Again, if you're doing your due diligence around establishment, so making sure that um, these tree rows are mulched, um, they're kept weed free um, during those early years. Um, and yeah, probably for you guys, you're going to need to be, um, what's it called, taking deer protection as well, or taking measures against deer. And I think that is one of the main challenges um, uh, for most of you up north uh, and in kind of less kind of cultivated uh, or managed uh, environs, basically. Um, but you know, with the right man, with the right establishment and the right species selection, you know, we can get good results in the first few years and then start to sort of fill out, increase the diversity and, um, you know, kind of, um, yeah, sort of diversify the plantings. So initially, I like to think of this idea of sort of get them in, get them up. Yeah, so this is where the sort of hybrid willows can come in. You know, they can give you that cover in that early few years, for example, and they'll provide protection for later plantings of perhaps more kind of natives or again more diversified uh, planting. So you can think of them as a bit of a sort of pioneer um, um, option, if you like, as part of your kind of species um, mix. Um, okay, so let's come out of this. So that's weight cleanse. Before we uh, go on, would it be okay if we uh, address some questions that came from the visit in Wakeley? Thanks. Of course, yeah, good idea. Uh, so, um, Doug was asking, what time of the year do they caucus? Um, is the, there a particular the time? Yeah, in the winter. Uh, so it's normally done in the dormant season, basically when the leaves have fallen. Yep. That's great. Uh, then there was another question about what product products are envisaging the timber area to yield? Other than just, is it just biofuel or is there something else to it? So the, the timber in this case, I feel is the least explored um, of this particular design. And this, this farm was kind of laid out as a demonstration farm. And it was also 
one of the first plantings of, of its type anywhere in Europe, and certainly the first of its type in um, um, the UK. And I think ultimately what we should be doing when it comes to species selection is working back from the end point. Yeah. So what kind of product do you want? When will it be harvested and for whom? And uh, I think the sort of long term um, crops like trees and like timber are always going to be a bit tricky on that front, basically. And there's a great example here on the Wakeland site, this little block, this little sliver um, of green that extends off one of their fields. It's nothing to do with them. This is matchwood basically planted with the Bryant and May um, contract, I think in the 50s or 60s. And then, you know, that contract was then sort of terminated within sort of, you know, five years or so. So this is now kind of like a remnant um, of that arrangement. So I think there are a lot of potential and a lot of opportunity with with timber. It certainly can be a very high value product, particularly if you go the extra yard with the value adding. And that's basically dressing that timber, um, so squaring it off or planking it. Um, so just using something like a wood miser or a mobile sawmill. Uh, and it's thought that that particular uh, processing or upcycling work increases the value uh, the most um, uh, of any sort of raw material that's sort of gleaned from the land. I think I forget how much it is basically, but, you know, it goes from sort of, you know, hundreds of pounds a ton to thousands, if not more pounds uh, per ton, basically. Um, the, the issue with timber, and I would say it's probably the least attractive, at least in the short term, or at least to be th thought through the most, is that you need to have a straight saw log. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> so, so your trees need to be specimen trees effectively, or at least a good proportion of them will need to be specimen trees. So they'll need to have a straight stem, be free of branches to about five or six metres, um, and otherwise be a fairly kind of good looking individual tree. Yeah, because you really are sort of managing individuals at that sort of price point, if you like. Um, that said, um, trees grown for timber or just generally the sort of biomass accumulation in an agroforestry system is will always outstrip that in a straight forestry system. Yeah, because if we look at this planting here, in fact, if we compare it to the sort of block planting in the, in the sort of the foreground, uh, we're sort of reverse. So this is the north here. Um, you can see that these rows of trees have got universal access to light, more or less. Yeah, they they have a little bit of shading cast by their neighbours in front and behind them, but next to them they've got very little shading. Yep. So they have they will grow much faster um, than an equivalent planting of um, sort of forestry or thinned forestry yeah, or plantation forestry. The other thing about the quality um, of the saw log that's produced in an agroforestry system is that, again, compared to a thinned plantation system, um, it doesn't go through this sort of growth and stasis, growth and stasis kind of cycle um, as the canopy closes um, and as the shade basically sort of suppresses growth. Normally that's managed by thinning, yeah, and that can be done basically, but that shows in the rings. So the actual grain uh, of the saw log is inferior um, in a thinned plantation system because you have all these kind of like variable widths in in the grain basically uh, again whereas the agroforestry has a nice even spacing uh, of the grain and um, much more rapid growth in that time frame um, but yeah again you know because we're talking sort of decades maybe sort of 20 years for something like a hybrid poplar um, uh, you're going to have to plan ahead and I think probably have to uh, put in a contingency plan and then also, um, um, what's the word, um, uh, you do your due diligence around management. Okay. So yeah, any other questions at this point? I think we sort of... Uh, I think that the last one is just a clarification. Ian and Robert are mentioning that uh, the 
Uh, let me just read the question. By faster, Ian is saying, by faster, I assume you mean faster in the stem diameter, not the tree height, yeah. when it comes to the trees, right? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Great. Okay, thanks for all your questions. So that's Wakelin's. Definitely recommend um, looking at Martin Wolf. He unfortunately died last year, um, but that's basically the, the kind of um, uh, the product of his life's work, um, as well as uh, the what's it called the um, population wheat, uh, and the population wheat that we now see the QR mixes um, basically um, were bred at Wakelands. So there's a lot to thank him for, basically. So now let's look at um, an example uh, in Scotland. So look at an, a high pasture example and see how we can potentially sort of like incorporate trees into that and take you through kind of a um, a design process. Um, so initially we'll look at Google Earth um, again and with a mind basically to be looking at the topography the aspect, any water issues, basically stuff that we can glean um, from the above ground, if you like. Uh, so let's just um, bring that in now so you can see whereabouts in the world we are. So we're going to look at this high pasture up here. Um, so as you can see, we've got a fairly kind of exposed um, location, sort of fairly near to the sea, got a bit of altitude. Um, uh, not much cover uh, nearby, basically, except from the north. So we have a, a well-established woodland here in the north. Um, so that's definitely going to be protecting us from um, some of the cold winter winds, if you like. But we've definitely got sort of open country when it comes to the westerlies and easterlies. So we'll be blowing across the site. Yeah, the aspect is sort of, well, basically sort of gently sloping or otherwise fairly flat. Um, so this is why I'm sort of calling it a high pasture rather than sort of an upland location. And I think we probably would say that it's sort of fits into that kind of improved pasture kind of um, uh, what's it called category um, as opposed to sort of sort of genuine rough pasture. Um, other things that we can glean from this site, if I can get the, that's it. Um, and this is one of the reasons why it's worth actually looking at different um, aerial images. Um, the people like Field Margin, for example, they incorporate Bing maps uh, onto their background maps. Um, and uh, Map Box is another one that you can look at. And each of those tends to give us a slightly different um, bit of information about the site. But we can see there's a little bit of a sort of damp patch here, for example, in the middle, another one sort of further up, yeah. Um, and, you know, having visited this site, you know, we generally are looking at sort of a fairly sort of, um, sort of wet field, certainly sort of in the tail end of the season and then through winter. Um, so yeah, I guess sort of, sort of in summary, uh, um, what are we looking at? Sort of, sort of a high pasture, fairly flat, probably sort of improved at, at one point um uh, generally sort of uh, on the wetter side and pretty exposed yeah um as well as that um we know that there is some, some sort of rotational grazing uh, work going on uh, at this site so it's really about now looking at how um our kind of design choices can improve um or both improve and diversify the conditions, I would say. Yep. So trying to achieve both of those objectives. Um, so the first thing we'll look at um, is kind of like this this heading or one of the um, principles that I work with, the whole farm planning principles. And this is sort of number nine on that one, basically. And our directive there is basically to provide protection for stock crops, grass and structures. Yeah. Um, because all of these um, features and sort of individuals benefit from um, protection, 
basically. So what we're looking to do is look into shelter from wind, driving rain and drifting snow. We're looking to shade livestock from strong sun and otherwise uh, looking to basically uh, create something of a microclimate that both stock will do better in, but also grass. Yeah, and um, there are good sort of anecdotal examples of people showing this year how areas uh, in their pastures, for example, they've got a little bit of shade, either from the hedge or some isolated trees, are still green. Yep, so a little bit of shading there um, and also a bit of diversity below ground. So when we're talking about shelter, one of the things we can look at is behaviour um, to kind of inform our analysis, if you like. Yeah, and here's an example from uh, the southwest of the UK. In this case, it's on X small at the end uh, of September. And as you can see, you know, most of the cover in this situation or is peripheral. Yeah, and this is generally speaking where you will see uh, um, trees on farm is around fields. Yeah, there are kind of peripheral feature. They're at the edge, hence the name hedge, for example. You know, there will obviously be some blocks, uh, maybe some, uh, you know, sort of clough woodlands in sort of uh, so called gills or otherwise kind of steep features or along um, watercourses. But generally speaking, they will be at a field boundary. Yeah. And that's fine. That's sort of sort of sort of isolated or, you know, extreme or the cover being on the peripheries is fine when it's fine. But when that weather turns, where's all the stock? Where have they all gone? Yep. So we've got the same number of groups in this image as we saw in the one before. I think it's actually a day later on the same site. Um, and this is the 1st of September, so we're not talking about any extreme weather going on here. But it definitely was, you know, sort of windy and kind of stormy, basically. You know, sort of pretty typical kind of early autumn gale um, blowing in. And where are all the stock? That's what I might ask you. I'm not sure if I can see the chat window. Um, but basically, they are all next to the hedges. So you've got a little group of Devon Reds up against the hedge here. You've got another group of young stock up against this hedge. And these um, sheep against this other hedge, basically. So they are seeking shelter. Yeah, and when they're seeking shelter, what are they not doing? Yeah, what are they not doing? They're not grazing, basically, or if they are, they're about to finish the forage that's available in that location. Yeah, so they're not grazing, so they're not putting on weight, for example. They're also concentrating all their manure right next to the hedge, which isn't really where we really where we really want it. Yeah, and actually, there's some good data that shows that sort of unsheltered situations have a detrimental effect on live weight. Yeah. Um, and they certainly have a detrimental effect on um, newborns, for example, and there's definitely a risk um, or high risk of mortality in uh, sort of unsheltered locations for newborns. Yeah. yeah. So again, you know, where's the stock in this image? They're right at the top of the corner of this field in a little impression next to a bunch of rocks and against the wall. So, you know, they're not stupid, basically. They're going to head for the part of the field where they feel most comfortable and potentially also the safest. Yep. So if we look at that sort of a bit closer up, you know, they're all kind of grouped together in this little sort of shelter, basically. And it's good that this field affords that type of feature, but it's not, not common. Yeah. Um, certainly in kind of upland situations. And I think what's really interesting is like in 2003, for example, when we had all that um, mortality on the high ground in Wales, um, where people like um, Gareth Wynne Jones kind of shot to fame, um, digging out, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of uh, uh, individuals that have been trapped in drifts with his bare hands and with diggers, you know, we can have avoided that basically by the strategic placement of trees and other features in the landscape because fundamentally the places where animals seek shelter are generally up against or uh, um, uh, impervious structures basically like on the on the hills there'll be stone walls for example or little impressions and these are the perfect place for snow drifts to collect yeah and in that situation the animal is damned if it then if she does and damned if she doesn't basically because if she stays out in the open pastures she'll die of exposure 
and yet when she seeks shelter, she can do nothing else but get trapped in, in a snowdrift. Um, so basically, we can in introduce shelter into our uh, operations, and it could look something like this, you know, just like green shelters using trees, shelter belts around feeding areas, or we could have um, sort of bale corrals, for example, um, putting up fences or otherwise incorporating agroforestry. Um, so let's look at that now, basically. So what's our process when we are sort of um, sequencing the different work um, we're going to do? Um, well, in this particular situation on the high pasture. Um, so we're going to look at field boundaries. Uh, we're going to look at headlands. We're going to look at boundary plantings, and then we're going to look at sort of interior. So the first thing to do with your design basically is to draw the field boundary. Uh, and in this case, we're sort of ignoring the sort of uh, sort of subdivision down the centre because we we can see that they have been historically managed as two fields. But in this case, we'll we'll treat them as a single block. So we draw our um, field boundary, then we create an offset or a sort of virtual end rig, basically. And in this case, is a this is a twelve meter um, uh, end rig, uh, and you know this is a, a a figure that you would need to actually sort of like um, make sure is comfortable um for your machinery basically so if we're going to do any sort of silage or hay cutting for example um in this field we need sufficient turning space at the head of the row um to turn our units so this is what a, a sort of endrig would look with look like without shelter belts um and this is what um a, a, a again an endrig might look like a bit closer up yep and again, obviously, it's the widest unit that we need to be uh, worried about, basically, uh, having comfortable turning width at the end of the row, basically. Um, and then the design might look something like this. And again, these are just sort of indicative ideas, yeah, to sort of illustrate the sort of options that you could look at, yeah, and how you might combine different sort of planting types. So if we look at this sort of, you know, in, in more detail, or in fact, maybe let's just give you give you the list. Uh, uh, so on the on the on the peripheries, we've got um, some evergreen shelter belt. Yeah, it could be single row, could be double row uh, on each on both sides. Yeah, we may not need it on the west. We certainly would want it on the east. Yeah. If we're going to be outwintering um, any animals, or if we're going to be out grazing in the sort of shoulders of the seasons at a very early or late season, for example, um, and obviously we're going to be getting quite strong westerlies, bringing in sort of heavy rain and driving rain. So there is a, an ex, uh, a um, what's it called an indication uh, for having um, protection on both the west and the east. And in this, this situation, what we're looking for here is something that's quite dense and something that's quite upright, yeah, in terms of the branching habit of those plants. Yeah, if we're going to have good protection from strong easterly winds, you know, bringing those cold um, and um, dry winds from Siberia, you know, the beast from the east, or bringing those strong wet winds from the coast, yep. Um, then we're going to want something that has a, a dense canopy and branches all the way to the base. Yeah, generally speaking, when it comes to shelter belts, we're sort of a, between a little bit of a rock and a hard place. What we're looking for here is something that's very fast growing. Yeah, because what this is that is here to do is basically to provide shelter for your other plantings, your other um, sort of plantings or stock. So they're the sort of the vanguard, if you like, that are going to provide the shelter for later plantings and for grazing and for crops. But in this case, um, just for grazing and subsequent plantings of trees. Um, and generally speaking, uh, more rapidly growing plants or the more rapidly growing plants are broadleaf, with things like willow and poplar being the fastest growing by a long way, by a country mile, or certainly the hybrid poplars and willows. Um, but the issue with them is they uh, they are deciduous. They give us no winter cover. 
Yep. And in fact, they're really only going to be in leaf until December. So we're going to be free so without any cover from December right through to probably end of March, I'd say. So that four month period, basically. And obviously that's not really a, a major concern if there's no intention to do any outwintering. Um, but um, if you are, then this is a kind of a real boon, basically. Um, the other thing that's worth mentioning is that the density um, of these different plantings really impacts how effective they are as a shelter belt. Uh, so let's just little, look at a sort of diagram to sort of illustrate that point. Um, basically, um, these are some very not, not particularly legible uh, graphs, but basically the kind of take home from both of these is that as the porosity goes down, the wind breaking goes up. Yeah, um, with the exception of a solid structure. Yep. So the, the densest foliage down here at 22 percent or 33 percent is the sweet spot in terms of the most wind breaking, the most bang for buck, if you like. Yep. Because um, these, generally speaking, aren't productive plantings. They're there to do one job and do it well and do it quickly. Yeah. The other issue is um, branching habits. Yeah. And generally speaking, certainly deciduous trees uh, and also uh, many conifers tend to sort of open out at the base. Yeah, certainly things like willow, for example, they have quite a spreading habit, kind of form that lollipop shape, if you like. And even things that have a more sort of like, um, uh, what's it called, triangular uh, shape or uh, pyramidal shape, uh, like the conifers and these Italian alders, they'll tend to hollow out at the base. Yeah, as they get older, they become hollow at the base. And this is the reason why we have to or should uh, would want to um, um, lay our hedges or otherwise trim hedges because otherwise they hollow out at the base because they're trying to grow into trees with a straight stem and, and you know, clear, clear stem and a branching habit, basically. So what we ideally want to find are species that are dense, don't have a, a spreading habit, have an upright ha habit, and don't hollow out at the base, and otherwise have as dense a foliage as possible, whilst also still being fairly uh, fast growing. And the only thing that I know of that fits that bill, basically, are cypress, yeah. Uh, and certainly when it comes to um, the amount of space that you want to sort of devote to a feature that is providing permanent um, shelter belt or windbreaking, uh, then cypress give you the best bang for buck. They have a very upright habit, maybe spreading to four or five, or maybe five to six meters when mature, yeah. Um, but but uh, they don't hollow out at the base and they have a very dense foliage basically. And here's just a bit of an example to show how these two, uh, I think these are oaks in this case, are doing better and worse. So here's a specimen that um, didn't make it into the planting, for example, and this specimen at the bottom right is actually sort of midway up on the leeward side. And in the, that is a much happier um, plant. So, you know, even just subsequent plantings, even sort of other deciduous plantings will benefit from the protection that these provide. Um, and in turn, you know, uh, physical structures um, actually help um, trees to get going as well. So it, you can sort of mix and match these different options. Um, and again, this is that's a sort of a upland example from um, Wales. So if we come back to our example here, um, um, sort of on the east coast of Scotland. Yep, definitely indication for evergreen uh, protection, oops, on the west and the east, connecting that up to existing woodlands. So that's definitely all forest giving us protection from the north. So we've got a nice sort of U-shape kind of enclosure. Yep, and then as we move in, we can basically sort of diversify the plantings. And in this case, I've used a couple of example mixtures. So one, both of them being kind of sort of biomass blocks. So the one on this side is sort of three rows of 
um, willow in this case, fairly closely planted. So six meters spacing from the, the shelter belt um, and then th three meters each. And what will they they will do basically? They, they will grow much more rapidly um, than the conifer planting, yeah, probably twice as fast. Yeah. Um, so they'll help to pioneer um, the conifer plantings. Yeah. And then as the conifer basically fills out and matures, you can then start harvesting uh, on a short kind of short rotation those that standing, standing material on the inside. It would also give a seasonal cover for the, in, the interior of the field. Um, and then we can look at this example here on this other side, and this is an example of an interplant. So one of the things we can do basically uh, is we can interplant our tree species to kind of diversify um, their functions or potentially their aesthetic. So, you know, if there is concern about the aesthetic of cypress, for example, then you can interplant them with um, climbing flowering plants. So clematis, honeysuckle, other, otherwise, you know, quite a sort of robust, fast growing um, climbers that will provide sort of forage and pollinator um, fodder, basically, and um, sort of break up that quite sort of uniform uh, planting. And in this case, on the inside, this situation we have like hybrid willow, in this case, just a single row, um, again, six meters in from the center of the um, uh, the conifer and in this situation it's in, in, interplanted with ivy uh, uh, and that again will give us sort of more winter cover yeah and also some additional brows and it, the, the additional quality of brows and then and what we're looking to do is to repeat that same mixture at a wide spacing through the interior of the field and that will provide sort of that more kind of sort of robust more kind of like intermediate sort of wind breaking yeah and then and between that, we have a mixture of different plantings, basically on a basically a 12 meter alley and a two meter tree strip. So in this case, it's basically going um, uh, biomass willow and ivy, then mixed um, willow, native willow and poplar. So things like aspens, for example, goat willow, that kind of thing. And then um, sort of mixed browse natives. So things like hazel, uh, birch, rowan, and otherwise sort of like high, um, highly palatable broadleaf species. So when our animals are sort of strip grazing up these alleys, yeah, they'll have access to um, sort of, you know, a selection um, of willow or, or poplar on one side and then a mixture of, um, what's it called, browse on the other side, it's kind of a sort of mixed browse on the other side. Um, so let's just look at some images to sort of show kind of what we mean by that. Um, so again, kind of, you know, when it comes to browse, ivy is always going to be the, the one that beats them all. And it's great because it's evergreen. Uh, so it's out there in winter, for example, and animals uh, that I've seen will always preferentially select that highly palatable, um, high intake species. Um, otherwise, we can also be coppicing this material. So for example, this is popular from uh, Wakelands in the bottom left and Hazel in the top right. And that is a significant amount of dry matter there, basically, um, that can be harvested as browse, basically, on a sort of ad lib basis. Yeah. And then we would basically coppice that um, on a sort of like one, two, three, or, you know, um, a short rotation uh, coppice. And what that would help to do is prevent like a browse line being produced and kind of reset the height. And then we would control access to the sort of the center of these trees using electric fencing yeah so we just direct electric fencing on either side of the alleys so, and we can allow them access to browse what hangs over for example and then at the end of the season or during a dry spell for example we can give them sort of fairly unfettered access to the the whole tree row and in the same way that we're sort of doing our forage um rationing with the grass we can do that same idea with um browse basically so i like to think of it as as another form of standing um forage basically but in this case you know very highly nutritious and actually there's some good data that's showing that most trees in fact i think all trees but certainly a significant number of tree leaves have a significantly higher protein content than even clover for example uh, i should have that slide here but that was quite an interesting one to me 
so yeah these are the kind of species that we'd be looking at in the in the different mixes and the different rows if you like so the, the sort of the fast growing kind of pioneer row basically that's hybrid willow and poplar so the willow varieties that um, I've identified are in Endeavour, Terra Nova and Tora and they've all been demonstrated to do well on Orkney for example and another uh, other high altitude trials in the UK um, and all produce quality brows um, as well as you know pretty sort of well very rapidly growing and producing high volumes of um, what's it called biomass that can then be chipped for bedding or composted or used as bedding and then composted or chipped and used for biomass and then turned into biochar and then for bedding and then returned to the soil for example um, and then otherwise you know if we want to be a bit more native or again you know in this situation we were looking at sort of a a mixture of natives and hybrids in different rows because what we're looking to do here is match the speed of growth with the species that we're mixing in the row so we're obviously try to, trying to turn turn the diversity dial up as much much as possible but there's no point planting like holly in with hybrid willow for example because the hybrid willow will just dominate so in this case what i've tried to do is find sort of two or three species um, that sort of complement each other grow at a similar rate for example um, so I certainly think that aspen and goat willow and probably sort of white willow um, uh, would do well, certainly in Scotland. Uh, and, you know, the aspen and the willow have, you know, very highly prized um, brows. And then obviously things like maybe field maple uh, going along with that. So again, this is sort of a little bit of a sort of um, a kind of mix and match um, design here. Um, but I think actually that mixture of those three different tree row types would, would work actually um, and give you know good production, good shelter, some year round protection from the ivy, for example, and from the, the shelter belts um, and increase the production uh, across the way. So I might um, invite questions at this point because um, we've kind of gone through a sort of a, a design so a full design cycle now, if you like, we've, we've you know, done the headlands, you know, we've got our sort of 12 meter headlands, we've identified our, um, the full width of the space. I think that's one of the things that sort of missed out as one slide. What we want to try and do is find out what the full width of that is and then divide that up. Um, and that will give us the number of rows that we can fit in this space. So we're a 12 meter alley and two meter tree rows. And again, this is a, um, kind of, a silver pasture system that we're looking at here, which would be suitable for uh, outwintering or certainly outgrazing um, uh, in the shoulders. And again, those willows and those rapidly growing trees will help to dry out the field in a kind of natural way, basically, uh, as well as also help to structure the soil. So, yeah, is there any questions on the point that we're at now? Gordon said, how many years did you introduce the livestock? Oh, in year one, straight away. So again, um, what we're looking at here would be um, temporary electric fencing. So things like, again, uh, depending on the stock that you're working with, if it was cattle, it could it could just be single strand. And you basically throw up a line on either side. So it'd be like a long laneway, basically and then strip graze them down the individual cells down the length. You, you may consider even with, with, even with cattle going to a two strand system, um, and that would then give you a little bit more leeway about how close you could fence to the trees. What we want to have is a little bit of under, under grazing basically, because that controls the grass growth next to the young trees. But what we don't want them to do is basically to strip bark or to actually get hold of the sort of the stem itself and pull it over basically so that's the sort of thing what you all need to be aware of but two strand fencing both controls the amount of brows what where they're reaching up over and the sort of undergrazing as opposed to single strand is really just the, the distance away from, from uh, the trees and obviously with um, sheep then we'd be looking at a three three strand system and the kiwi tech system is probably the best sort of flexible, fast wind and fast um, fix uh, temporary fencing solution that would work and it would work in, with these plantings. So yes, we definitely want to get the animals out first year. Is there anything other than fencing that could be used? Because they're commenting that's an awful lot of fencing that you would need to be using. 
Yeah, so this is why we would look at all, all temporary fencing. Yeah. Um, uh, um, again, sort of one of the sort of key sort of tenets that I work with um, under the whole farm planning principles is to favour um, temporary rather than we need to mute somebody there, by the way. Um, so, yeah, I think one of the, the, the big issues that we have on farm is redundant infrastructure, you know, stock fencing, for example, um, and permanent water troughs that just lie idle for like months of the year, basically. They may only be really in use for sort of three months in total for the whole year, and yet they still have to be there. And what's happening to them then? They're rotting, 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 rusting and depreciating. So in this situation, and with, I would say, all grazing situations, um, personally, we would look to move to a fully temporary system. And in this situation, basically, we would have enough fencing to take us, you know, down one alley and back most of the way another. And that's all we'd need, basically. Yeah. So we're just fencing where the animals are and we move the fence up with them. Yeah. So we want something that's basically quick to handle, quick to, to reel in and, and reel out, basically. And having nice straight tree rows, for example, really helps with that because you know where you're going and one of the things that i didn't really mention before is that again we could do this in a phased planting yeah so phase one would definitely be these kind of wide spaced um uh, hybrid willow plantings uh, and if you just planted those in year one for example you would end up with an alley width that was basically 112 meters lot wide by about 400 meters long so that each block is about an acre uh, or a little bit more or yeah so you can see what kind of uh, blocks we're working with. But you may want to go into 24 meter spacing, for example, or even wider than that. Um, so that's sort of that's that's kind of a movable feast, if you like. But certainly um, temporary fencing, a flexible and efficient temporary fencing solution will do you well in all of your grazing operations and will particularly suit um, new agroforestry plantings. Yeah, so any other questions? Uh, another question that we had like uh, before uh, through um, an email was just asking about good software that you could use in a situation like this to start planning your, um, uh, your agroforestry design. Yeah, um, I'm still waiting to find that one out. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, I can tell you how or what I used for this. Um, it's a professional package. It's a, like a basically an AutoCAD type um, uh, system. Basically, a any CAD package will do this work basically, but it's not particularly elegant. They tend to be pretty clunky and otherwise pretty expensive. Um, so, um, what I tend to do is direct people to use field margin for sort of, you know, the kind of the, the basics, if you like, and to sort of work out rough areas, basically, and then, you know, go to look to do stuff that's more accurate. Um, you can still do measures, for example, but you can't do things like parallel lines. You can't do duplication. You can't do offsets um, and stuff like that, unfortunately. Um, which is a shame because actually the, those types of features aren't massively complicated. But there are some um, open source options. So SketchUp will do this work again, not particularly elegantly. Um, and I forget what the kind of the main open source CAD tool is. But yeah, if you, if you look it up, there's a couple of them out there. Um, so whilst we're kind of uh, like inviting the next question, I'll just sort of move on, I think. And show here's an example of that sort of sort of phase one, what a phase one planting might look like. So again, we've got the shelter belt in. Yeah, that's definitely what we want to get in year one. And then we've got our sort of main subdivisions. And in that situation, you might double fence them with like semi-permanent um, electric fencing. But again, I would suggest that you know get going with the temporary fencing and make that work for you. And then it can work for any spacing, any pattern, pretty much any field more or less. Um, so, yeah, the other outcome from this work, if you like, and the reason why we do 
this design work fundamentally is that we are trying to sort of you know, draw up a bit of a kind of bill of materials. Yeah. Um, so by doing this, doing our going the extra yard with the design work, we basically identify how much running footage we've got um, or how much linear um, uh, meters we have um, for any particular planting block. Yeah, so we can get a total of those rows and then all we need to know is what the, um, uh, what's it called, the species mix we're working with is and uh, then we can go out and get some quotes. So it might look something like this, for example. Yeah, with the green being the sort of year one. Um, but you get a kind of simple total at the bottom there. And then if you know what you're planting, um, spacing is for example so one meter spacing is sort of fairly common for like biomass plantings um then you're looking at one uh, tree per meter uh, so in this case they were looking at about six and a half thousand meters i haven't done that calculation for um for our upland farm but i would say maybe it would be about half that or maybe slightly more because it's a bigger field but with wider spacing um but as you can see, sort of having wider uh, alleys means fewer trees. Um, so that's kind of, I guess, it's a bit of a no brainer, but just want to sort of make that kind of explicit. Um, so this is what the mixture looks like. So we're looking at basically all this, this sort of design. So fairly narrow spacing, hybrid subdivisions, what you might call them as pioneer browse bank or pioneer shelter belts and shade belts, potentially copying them at them at five years. And then mixed broadleaf infill, so late succession nutrient browse bank. So that's your, your rowans, your um, hazel, that kind of thing. And then a good amount of kind of like native willows and poplars. And that's your really high quality. And again, we can interplant that with ivy. Um, and there may be a sort of cost implication with that, but I think that actually can ivory over the years can spread over quite sort of, sort of long distances, especially if you help it along. Um, OK, so any sort of questions on that? Um, so I guess I'll sort of reiterate this point that I made earlier. I think that there's, there is a, perhaps sometimes a little bit of an overemphasis on natives and on, on hedging species. And I think it's important to note that, like, you know, if you plant a hedge, that's a sort of 10 year function in terms of it sort of actually sort of coming back as a sort of shelter feature. Obviously, it provides um, uh, habitat and some forage, um, depending on how it's ma managed. Um, but I think that we can go beyond that, basically, and incorporate, you know, some other species and some hybrids, basically, to help um, diversify the system. Uh, and, you know, they still have, you know, very high sort of bird habitat, still have significantly higher invertebrate habitat than just open field, basically. Um, and they also provide a sort of diversification below ground because all trees are associating with ectomycorrhizae as opposed to your sort of crops and your, um, um, what's it called, uh, grasses, which are associating with our, our muscular mycorrhizae. So where you have the both, you're doubling up on that diversity, basically. Um, okay. So we have a question around how do you stop the year from eating a red Yeah, I mean, that's going to be the big challenge, basically, I think, uh, for new plantings in Scotland. Um, I wouldn't say there's a magic fix, and I think everyone knows that, really. Um, I think it's basically going to be a combination of things, maybe some temporary um, uh, deer fencing, the kind of thing that pe people erect around new coppice, coppices, for example. Um, it doesn't actually need to be a particularly sturdy fence because actually at the end of the day, it's really just, a, it's a psychological barrier. Because even, well, I mean, like a, a deer can jump a sort of six foot fence from a standing start, you know, with ease basically. But it just, it, it fears the danger of, of doing that because it doesn't know what's on the other side. Um, there are sort of salves and stuff. People make these kind of bone salves, for example. Um, Sepp Holzer is known for doing that and he kind of, swears by it kind of making a sort of like a noxious brew of old bones and other things and painting that onto the 
um, to the stems. Um, but I wouldn't, I don't know, is the answer to that, basically. But I would say that our sort of approach would be at one of analysis initially. So identifying what species of deer are present and what are the biggest deer that are present. Where do they move from, generally speaking, from from and to, if, if at all, you know. Uh, and obviously, you know, talking to the, uh, the gamekeeper and finding out as much as you can about the habits of the deers that are accessing your land. And then also, I think being um, aware in particular times of year, I think that's the other thing, is that we try and think of like, oh, we need to fence out all animals all year for, forevermore, basically. And A, that's never achievable. And B, I don't think it's necessarily the best use of our resources. You know, the time that they're going to be most interested in in your trees are in spring, for example, that new growth. Um, that's definitely the time when they're going to be most uh, up for uh, browsing on trees um, and otherwise when times are hard yeah I think expect them to start you know kind of utilizing your new plantings and I think to be honest actually sort of um, shooting and um, otherwise um, kind of sort of personal monitoring if you like is is indicated um, so you know if you can make a deal with uh, some gamekeepers, for example, that you're like, you know, you're paying them to come to the land and it, you know, if they shoot some venison, then all the better. Um, but, you know, obviously that will kind of keep them a little bit on their toes, for example. So I don't know what the what the ultimate solution is, basically, but um, I think it would need to be a sort of mixture of solutions, basically. Um, OK. So. Let's look at kind of some examples that might be more kind of applicable for um, an arable cropping situation um, and in this situation let's just sort of um, look at the site we we have in mind um, and let's do that one I think it's further down actually want to go oops uh, a slight overshoot there um, but basically kind of like fairly shallow sloping um, um, ground uh, down to conventional management and in this situation we'd be looking at sort of wider spaced alleys um, probably on a 24 meter spacing again sort of determined by the the, the boom width of the sprayer in this case because it's conventional um, so 24 for example plus the, the width of the tree so that will basically give you something like 26 meters center to center so we'd effectively have tree rows running down each of these blocks or every other one for example so this field in the center is, is particularly indicated for that because we're already running um, the um, sprayer basically north to south um, and we'd have a fairly uniform length as well. So that helps with the management. Yeah, these other fields to the right or rather to the east um, would also be suitable. Uh, and in this situation, again, what we're looking to do is run the tree rows um, parallel with the sort of long axis of that field rather than basically going well, actually, in this situation, if we cut across that centre, going north to south might work. Um, but if we were just looking at this sort of easterly field, this sort of narrow field, then we would look to basically run the tree rows sort of fully north to south. Well, not north to south, but sort of, yeah, I guess we have three or four running the entire length of the field with the same end rig spacing at the head. There's so 24 metre or so end rigs, for example. Um, and again, we'd ideally want um, some shelter belts to go in there along the field boundaries as well, if that could, if that would fit. But I guess the main thing that's worth saying here about orientation is that is that like north to south is kind of the sort of the holy grail. But where we can't ensure that, or where that doesn't really work in terms of just creating loads of tiny little off, you know, irregular size and shaped strips then we want to go with the long axis and in this situation because we're slightly angled 
to the east. So we're basically what we are here is, I guess that's um, east, southeast, maybe as an orientation. That is probably that's certainly more optimal than being uh, orientated to the west. It basically means as the sun moves round in the beginning of the day, basically it will clear the head of the alleys sort of fairly early, you know, maybe sort of eight o'clock midsummer, for example, or nine o'clock midsummer, for example. Yeah, so you'll still have plenty of warmth and sun from the early part of the day. Yeah, if it was the other way around, I'll just, just kind of illustrate this by tipping the map around. Yeah, if it was basically that way, then we wouldn't get sun down the alleys until right in the sort of mid afternoon or towards the end of the day, basically um, in autumn and spring. Yeah, so um, this is why we're looking to sort of maintain our orientation on a north south. But if not, then a sort of easterly kind of um, pitch, if you like. Um, but other than that, kind of species choice for this situation, um, I would probably say that um, given the fact that there is some mixed um, operations going on, on on this farm, there's a demand for bedding and wood chip and biomass, potentially for heating, uh, for sort of biomass heating, you know, running a biomass boiler, for example. So I would say that actually, again, the, um, um, the coppice, short rotation coppice is definitely indicated. Um, and in that situation, we were looking, we'd be basically harvesting that material and removing it all, as opposed to browsing it and leaving a lot sort of, you know, standing, for example. And in that situation, I think that suits a kind of cropping situation. You know, we're cropping um, cereals and we can also be cropping and harvesting, basically sort of whole cropping effectively is what it is, um, trees, and then chipping them up and drying them uh, and using them in a biomass boiler or um, then using them as bedding basically uh, and by doing that basically we could definitely save quite a bit of money on our straw for example we would basically be producing um, an increased total amount of um, dry matter and um, tonnage per year over and above just the straw that would be gleaned from any um, um, crops and it also means we can return more of that straw to the soil so we can do more straw chopping for example because we've got another source of bedding uh, and when we're bedding on wood chip it's a much higher carbon material than um, than straw so we get you know quite a good quality FYM particularly if it's turned and composted properly basically um, so obviously willow would be um, uh, an indicated uh, variety um, as would other sort of like hybrids basically and I think probably hybrids are sort of are mainly indicated in, in this situation and again you know because we are orientating our tree rows sort of on that axis we're still getting that shelter effect again same with this field here we're still getting that shelter effect basically um so this is so just to show you what um a 24 meter alley might look like again this is to scale um and if we're zooming in and this is what it looks like sort of in elevation basically 24 meters between the tree rows and then two meter tree rows and then a sort of a shelter belt again in this particular pattern and this particular pattern is sort of a biomass tree and then some kind of productive tree um and i guess in there might be some indication in this location but again given the the, the, the scale of the farm and the operations that are going on currently most productive trees aren't really that indicated you know, those fruits and nuts, you know, they need particular markets, they need kind of value adding and all the rest of it, basically. Um, and this is what a 36 meter um, alley width would look like. And obviously, if you're working with a 24 meter boom, then 36 won't work. So you'd need to go straight to 48 meter um, to accommodate those two travels um, um, of the sprayer, basically. Um, but yeah, these are one of the main considerations that dictate um, alley widths. And again, you can see this um, planting isn't exactly north to south. In this situation is we're using the sort of eastern boundary as a sort of parallel. So we're sort of working parallel from that. Again, to reduce the number of sort of odd oddities in uh, the individual strips, basically. Um, 
OK, so any questions on um, where we've got so well, what we've covered so far? Not so far. I think that they've been mostly uh, answered while you talk. Great. Um, so again, in this sort of situation where we've got um, um, some slope to the land and we're looking at uh, um, what's it called? Uh, upland locations and you know fair amount of latitude this is when we want to have a mind to how we're dealing um, with snow basically and we can use trees basically as a way to control drifting yeah as opposed to our buildings being the places that control or, or induce drifting yeah so again it's a good ask a bit of a question here so where does the where does the snow mostly it collects in drifts is it in open fields or is it in roads and trackways is it next to buildings is it where we want it or is it where it is it where it doesn't affect farming operations well basically the kind of important thing to understand about um snow and snow drifting basically is that snow drifts are actually ice yeah these these are ice crystals that are basically being dragged along the the surface more or less or that kind of like interface with the surface of of the ground yeah so in the same way that water transports sediment yep yeah, in suspension um ice or snow in this case whatever you want to call it um that forms drifts is also carried in suspension you know you see where you see it kind of swirling along in the wind basically well it's that same process and you know when the wind speed is high just like when the water velocity is high basically its ability to carry uh, sediment is is quite high basically but as the wind speed drops then that ice basically will start to drop out and it will start to collect it will start to drift basically um so all obstacles slow wind yeah and where wind slows down its capacity to transport snow reduces yeah um so this is where we see deposition, basically. So we can look at kind of snow fences as way as a way to to deal with that. Um, but basically, you know, when we're sort of you know dealing with snow, where does it tend to to build up? Yeah, this is an example of controlled drifting. Yeah, but actually, most of the time, you know, we're dealing with it kind of like um, collecting in against non-porous structures. So basically, uh, snow collects again on the windward side of non-porous structures. Yep. So against walls, in depressions, and along roadways. Yep. Which, generally speaking, are the places where we exactly don't want it. Yeah. So you know, piling up against barns, filling up barns, basically, or against um, uh, what's it called? Other other outbuildings. The meaning meaning that the um, uh, access tracks around them become impassable or you've got to be shoveling snow continually basically um and again it's on that non-porous not non-porous side either against walls or in roadways basically uh, and i would say that is probably one of the main issues that we had with um uh, the beast from the east basically is that we have very open landscapes with little cover and little obstacles basically to slow the wind um and where we do have obstacles, they tend to be non-porous, basically. So they all all that, that snow is drifting against them. Yeah. So what we want to be doing basically is finding the right slide. Um, is what we can be doing is identifying um, that or placing porous structures in the landscape to induce drifting on the leeward side. Yeah. So this is where hedges come in, um, agroforestry plantings, shelter belts, for example, uh, anything that has a degree of porosity to it, basically, will induce drifting behind it, yeah, or on the leeward side. And that's what this image is showing here, basically. So it can be just something as simple as a temporary fence, yeah. Um, anything that sort of obstructs the wind, basically, will slow it down. You can see how much snow has actually uh, accumulated behind this fence yeah and you can see that the, the top of the drift is basically level with the top of the fence yeah but basically you know snow isn't really transported above sort of 12 foot with the majority of it being in the first sort of six foot or so um 
And if we're looking at the bottom right here, we can see just like an old planting of maize that wasn't cleared. Yeah, and again on this right hand side. So just leaving a strip or a margin of the field um, unharvested or stripper harvested, for example, then basically we have a space between our key feature that we're trying to protect from snow drifts, basically, and we create a sort of zone of drifting and drift accumulation. Um, so if we come back to um, our example uh, in this situation, um, then we probably haven't got too much problem around this particular farmstead here because we've got some sort of tree belts along here and along here. So that's not too bad. Um, this, I'm not sure if this is on the same property or not, but this also has some of that, so that's great. Um, but we might look at some of these access ways, for example, see which direction they are. And again, the main thing to, to understand or to remember is that the, where does the beast from the east come from? It came from the east, basically. So normally the, the winds that are bringing snows are coming from the east. You know, that's one of the things that we can be fairly certain of. Yeah. So, so if we could maybe come and look at the um, the access to this, this high pasture, for example, this particular um, access bay may be susceptible to drifting. Sorry, I'm just trying to get the map to work properly. Um, so along this track here, along this eastern edge, that is a potentially vulnerable uh, section. Basically, we've got very little cover. Some here, so we would see would see some isolated drifting, but it's quite, it's fairly patchy uh, as a space. Yep. So we could either be lo looking to beef up plantings along that field boundary, for example, and that would definitely be indicated in this situation. Um, or else we put like a temporary fence along the eastern boundary of this um, access way, for example, because you know it's probably the, this is probably the one and only way to get up and down that little section. So once it becomes blocked in one section, it becomes incredibly inconvenient. Um, so by just the strategic placement of plantings, and again, um, you know, a hedge would want to be fairly dense to actually sort of be collecting um, uh, snow along it, and it would want to be planted a little bit back from um, the, uh, what's it called, the, the track, basically. Okay, um, so I think that kind of it sort of uh, illust illustrates that point. Um, uh, most clearly, basically. Um, so, is there any other stuff that we should cover now, or any other questions from what we've dealt with so far? No, I think that we're fine. We're getting to the end of the time that we have. So, I think that if we have any further questions, we can address them at the beginning of the next uh, event on next Tuesday. If that's okay. Yeah.